I mean, oh. I'll just briefly cover the Hanan security in 8.0. So yeah, it's a, it covers almost everything, not just the connection security. To people. Sure. All right, so uh, I'm Harin Varodarya. Uh, very good afternoon to you all. And thank you for making here on time and staying awake after a nice meal probably. So yeah, um, I'm Harin. I work for server general team of MySQL, primarily focusing on security side of security feature side. Uh, I've been working with MySQL for the last five years now. Um, and yeah, so today's my talk is going to be about um, enhanced security features that we introduced in 8.0. Uh, as you all must be aware by now, uh, 8.0 is in RC phase at the moment. Um, we released 8.0.4 and we are planning to release 8.0.11. So yeah, let's see. Uh, safe harbor statement this is just for the information purpose only, not for your business decisions. Okay, so to quickly go over the features that we introduced in 8.0 as far as security is concerned. Uh, we added role support. This was a long pending feature in MySQL asked by many of our community members. We added dynamic privileges to help extend plugins to use the privilege system. Uh, we made our password policy enhancement and added the reuse restrictions. We have been doing this since 5.6 and in 8.0 we now complete the story. Um, we also added a new authentication plugin called Caching SHA2 Password. Uh, that's for the improved security of the server. Uh, in 5.7, we started introducing features for encryption at rest for disk-based encryption that is transparent. We are now extending it to cover redo and unblock encryption as well. And we also made the user management DDLs atomic to ease out the pain of handling the mixed cases of error versus failures. All right. So I'll start by roles. Uh, I'll take one feature at a time or till the time permit. OK. So just some introduction, what are roles? Roles are essentially containers for privileges. You can group together related privileges, create a role, grant that role to users to make your uh, database administration easy. Um, for all practical purposes, they are just like any atomic or any basic uh, privileges like select or insert or update or delete. You can grant it to any user. You can even grant it to other roles as well to, you know, kind of create a hierarchy of roles. So why, why roles? I mean, why can't you directly grant privileges to users? Of course, you can grant privileges to users. So you have a user. You want that user to perform a bunch of tasks, and you grant all those privileges to user, and that user will be able to do all those tasks. Perfectly valid example. It works. The problem begins when number of user increases. So with each in each added user, if you want to perform those users to, uh, you know, if you want those users to perform same set of tasks, you'll have to repeatedly grant all the privileges again. So if you have five, three privileges, you have 15 grants in total. Now add to the scenario that you want to add one more privileges to this kitty or remove one privileges from the kitty. So you have to repeat the task for each of the user or else you will have a scenario where some of the user can perform certain extended tasks where others can't. So enter roles. What you do is create a role that serves as a container, grant all the privileges to the role, and then just grant that role to all users. If you want to add a privilege, you just need to add one grant, because all the grants that are granted to a role will propagate to all the users automatically. If you think that there are certain extra privileges given to the role, well, remove them. And all the removal will directly affect all the users who are granted that role. Sorry. So it, you know, it makes the administration part of uh, privilege easy. Um, it keeps your design clean. All right. So how do we implement roles in MySQL? Uh, first of all, if the roles share their namespaces with user. What essentially means is if you have a user with a name foo, you can't have the role with the same name because both of them are stored in the same table. The, the clash will prevent you from creating a role. Uh, we store the grant information which says which role is granted to which user or which other role and how it is granted. I'll come to this part later. And we also store role activation information that enables a role 
uh, by default for any of the user. So let's see. Um, you can use create role to ro create a role, which is essentially a sugar-coated way of create user. It essentially creates a locked user account, basically. Drop role and the role is gone. But creating and dropping a role alone doesn't make a role role. What makes a role role is the grant or revoke. So when you grant a role to a user, that's when a role becomes a role. Or an to be more specific, an authorization ID becomes a role. And we also allow something called with admin option when you are granting roles to other users because um, it allows creation of lesser admins. You can choose certain users who are responsible for managing the role itself, the grant of the role itself. So you can delegate the duty by with admin option. So any user that has this, uh, that has been granted the role with admin option, they can further grant the role to other users and you know lessen the load of the core uh, root administrator probably. Uh, Roles, yes, now once you grant the role, the user will start inheriting properties. But in order to use the role, the user has to set the role first. So to set a role, we have a set role syntax. So user connects, does a set role foo, and it starts uh, inheriting all the properties from the role foo. After that, it can perform all the tasks that foo enables. For example, if foo enables select from all the tables, after doing set role foo, the user will be able to do select from all the tables. You can set all roles or set none of the roles. Those are syntax variations available. Uh, and one more important feature is activation of the role by default. So you can mark certain roles as default. When they are marked as default, immediately upon login, the roles are activated. So you no need to say set role and then start using it. Just log in and start using. Um, we have introduced something called mandatory roles. Now, uh, it's, it's like grant to public. You want certain privileges available to all your database users so that you don't repetitively have to create grants for those items. So what you do is you create a role, you set as a mandatory role. It's a system variable, actually. So you set the system variable to a list of roles that you want to mark as mandatory roles, and that's it. So any user that logs in gets those mandatory roles by default even if you have not explicitly said that grant role public to user. It, uh, it takes place automatically. All you have to do is just set role and then start using it. Uh, and well, we have introduced a cool way to look at the role hierarchy. You can take a look at which all roles are granted to which all users, um, whether they are granted with admin option or without administration option. It's a GraphML output. You can use Dia and GraphML to render it and create a visual, uh, uh, you know, visual representation of your privileged system. All right. So enough about roles. Let's move to the next one, that is uh, dynamic privileges. So uh, let me give some background. Um, we have something called super privilege. I'm sure, uh, for the show of hand, who doesn't know about super privilege? All right, so yeah, you know about super. So as on 5.7, uh, the latest 5.7 that we have, there are 12 different tasks that super can perform. And as my uh, colleague Joro would put it, it's twice as many as the Alice had to do. So yeah, it's there are 12 tasks, mostly unrelated. For example, if you have super, you can manage binary log, and at the same time, you can manage encryption. Two of them have nothing in common, but well, you are, if you if you have super, you can do both. So, you know, it, it has become kind of a jack of all trade. Um, there is no further granularity which allows you to grant only a specific set of privileges and not the other. If you grant super, you get everything. Um, adding of a new privilege is difficult. It requires changes at code level, at our system table level. It propagates very deep. So what happened is, as we introduced new plugins, and in more often than not, plugins would require, cert, require to do certain privilege action. And to do that privilege action, you need to rely on certain privilege. What will you do if you have it, you know, you find it difficult to introduce a new privilege? You will basically piggyback on the existing one. And that made super, you know, a bit more fatter. So now there are plugins like audit, firewall, uh, more recently, group replication, which are 
leveraging on super to perform privilege check. So this was kind of becoming a problem and we decided to, yeah, you know, it kind of became like this. Uh, so we decided to resolve this issue. Um, we did two things. Um, we basically broke super into more granular chunks. So now you can say that if you want to grant somebody an ability to administrate binary logs, you can precisely do that and nothing else. If you want somebody else to do maintain your global system variables, you can grant privileges which will be which will grant them ability to change the variables and nothing else. So we broke super into 13 chunks for server management part and further four chunks for plugin related task. So this this is something called dynamic privileges and why because it makes it easy to add new privilege and this part is for plugin developers more because as we add new plugin uh, the plugin developer can register unregister a new privilege with server let's say, let's say if i'm developing a plugin called foo i can go and say hey if you install this plugin i want server to recognize foo admin as the new privilege and server will say sure and then grant revoke is supported server will be able to check that privilege against you know whether the user has foo admin or not and say yes or no to the plugin so so we, we did that and then we used it in our audit firewall and group replication plugin so now they are instead of well they are still relying on super because it's still available but deprecated but they also allow you to perform those tasks by introducing new dynamic privileges for example a, Audit introduces audit user, firewall introduces firewall user and firewall admin, so, so on and so forth. So, yeah. So in future, any new plugin will, uh, that's we, that we introduce or any of the plugin uh, developer introduce can make use of this functionality. All right. Okay. So password reuse policy. Uh, I would begin by this. Uh, with 5.6, we started working on the ways to improve our password policies. So we started with uh, password strength validation. That essentially allows you to make sure that your password is not weak. Probably it contains uppercase letter, lowercase letters. It doesn't contain commonly known insecure password like ABCD123456 or something like that. You can manage all these things using the plugin called Validate Password. Uh, Another step that we took partially in 5.6 and more in 5.7 is password expiry. That allows an admin to explicitly expire a user's password and thereby forcing that user to change the password on the next login. Or we'll schedule a password for expiry that after n days or let's say 10 days or 15 days the password will expire or 3 months password will expire, something like that. So this two we did in 5.6, 5.7 combined. The last piece that I was missing was password reuse policy. Well, I, I can change password, but I can reuse the same password and server will not complain, right? I mean, as long as the password is changed, server is satisfied. So what we did is to introduce reuse policy on two things. One is based on the history. You can now say that a user cannot reuse last 10 passwords. Um, you have to have a new password. We have a new configurable system variable that allows you to configure that value for all the users or you can use create alter user extensions um, which allows you to specify a specific value for a certain user. So if there are sensitive account and if you want to increase the restriction that instead of 10 my sensitive account won't be able to use 20 last password you can do that using this. Another restriction that we added is restrict the use based on time. So you can say that you cannot, you can reuse a password as long as you have not used it for the past six months. Or, I mean, it, it takes in, in terms of number of days, so you can configure it at any interval. So both these restrictions apply when a user is changing a password. If somebody is, uh, and yeah, the reuse based on time has similar configuration. Uh, there is a system variable to configure it by default for all the users. And on top of it, you have password reuse policy related extension to configure it for individual users or sensitive accounts. So with this, we have all the three parts. We have password validation plugin, we have a mechanism to expire password, and now we have a mechanism to prevent the reuse of the password. So that sort of completes and gives an administrator control over how passwords are used in the system. 
All right. Uh, in eight dot zero, and this is uh, we introduce a caching SHA two password plugin. It's a new authentication plugin. Um, it uses SHA two fifty six hash, which is much more secure than the SHA one hash, which right now we are using for MySQL native password. It uses salted SHA two fifty six hash that we hash it for five thousand times. Uh, when we store the transformation uh, um, in the mysql.user table, there are two modes in which this plugin operates. There is an uncached mode, which requires an actual password to be sent to server, and it's restricted to use the secure connection. Or there is a challenge response mechanism, which can work on the plain text connection as well. So let me just uh, give a brief detail. So, okay. Um, Imagine a situation where a user wants to connect to the server. I, I will skip the initial step where first user will say, hi, I want to connect. The server will say, hey, these are my capabilities. And here is a challenge for you. So once the server sends challenge, the, uh, the client uh, creates a response using the password that it knows and send it across to the server. Now server knows that uh, server keeps an in-memory cache where it maintains hash of the password per account. And it says, hey, I don't have an entry for you, so let's switch to uncached mode. And in uncached mode, server says that I want your password, and that password should be sent over a secure channel. So client sends a password over a secure channel. Server compares it against the salted SHA-256 hash, which is basically stored in mysql.user table. And if everything goes as planned, server will say, yes, it's success. You can come in and do your job. At the same time, server will update the cache so that in the next phase when the same user try to log in again you just have to send the scramble so next time server will again send a new challenge a new response will be created sent to the server but this time around the server will have the cached password in the memory available and it can simply say yes or no based on the challenge response verification so yeah as you see cache mode is faster it Basically, as long as there are no changes in your authentication data, um, the cache will persist. And as long as cache persists, once you have created a cache entry for a user, next time onward, you pay less price for authentication. So it's faster. Of course, we invalidate the cache in events of sensitive change, like password change, or you have renamed a user, or dropped a user, or well, you did a flush privilege by means you are saying that, okay, get rid of everything that you have in cache and just read everything from the table. So at those instances, the cache is flush. That means that the next attempt that the user made, um, they have to go through the uncached version of the protocol. This is new default for MySQL server. So if you are using 5.7 and upgrading to 8.0, any new user that you create without specifying the plugin information, simply saying create user foo identified by haha, and that user will start using this plugin. So yeah, make a note of this if you are planning to upgrade. All right, so enough about, oh yes, okay. So these are the other enhancements that we made in 8.0. Um, we introduced two system variables that controls the encryption of redo and undo log. We, in 5.7, we added support for user table encryption. So we now extend it. And this is transparent. User doesn't need to do anything. The keys are generated automatically. The keys are stored in key ring. All you need to do is configure server to use a plugin. Uh, that's key ring plugin. And that's about it. The server will manage everything else on its own. Um, we also made the user management DDLs atomic. Till 5.7, um, it's possible that when you, are, when you have a user management DDL which consists more than one user, it is possible that some of them will get failure and other will succeed. But in 8.0, that's not the case. So all the partial changes are gone. It's either everything is done or nothing is done. So it makes replication life easy because uh, you don't have to carry error all the way through the slave and then expect the same error on the slave, etc. And last but not the least, uh, we made certain changes related to how we link against SSL library. Now we dynamically link against OpenSSL and all our community distribution now have linkage against OpenSSL against YSSL. So, yeah, this is the summary. Thank you for your time. Any questions?
Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yep. It's smooth to InnoDB. Okay. Uh, well, it's required because I wanted, you know, as I said, we made it atomic, yes. and InnoDB is a transactional DB that we have. We required that property. The encryption on the user table level has been there since 5.7. Yeah. Um, and keyring. Uh, yeah. So uh, in 5.7, we introduced keyring service mm -hmm. and a bunch of keyring plugins. We have community edition, which is a file based keyring essentially. And we have commercial editions, which can use uh, a proper backend keyring backends like HSMs and stuff, KMIP compliant. You can use the keyring. Server has uh, variables, which make sure that keyring is fired up even before InnoDB, because InnoDB leverages on keyring in the recovery mode. So all these things are in place. You have to configure server to start with the keyring. After that, when you create a table, you say that create table so and so encryption equal to yes, and that's it. I mean, no, nothing else is required. You don't need to provide any key. You don't need to provide anything. Everything is just main. You know done by the keyring plugin that is introduced. So right before uh, inserting data into the uh, table, it will be encrypted and returned to the disk. Once we read the data from the disk at the time of select or any of the query, we decrypt it and present it to user. So as long as you have the privilege over the table, you will be able to see the data. But your on-disk data is always encrypted. Is there any performance over Not that we found. I mean, not very significant, no. From our study, it's not that. Because uh, it's only encrypted and decrypted when you are reading or writing pages to and from the disk. Rest of the time, it's available to the user in an unencrypted form, as long as it is, uh, uh, user has the permission, of course. And with the redo and undo, does it affect the replication? The configuration of keyring is, uh, you know, separate for each of the node in replication. If you have a user table for which you are using encryption, then yes, that you have to replicate the same change on the slave as well. I mean, you need to make sure that slave also support encryption because create you, create table encryption equal to yes goes as it is on the other node. So you need encryption support, otherwise the replication will fail. For redo log, undo log, they are driven through system variables. So, Venkat? Yes. So redo log, undo log, it's driven through uh, system variables. And system variables are not bin logged. Uh, we pick only few system variables which are very important. Only, only they will go to scale. Right. So for that. Because some cases you don't really, if, for example, you take a buffer pool size. Just an example. If you are setting it on one particular machine, you don't want that setting to propagate to many things. So we have chosen only few system variables which are very important, and those things only will go. So uh, yeah, I think it. It. I mean, to my understanding, it would not. I mean, you have to configure it individually on slave for redo and do I can check it out and confirm. Yeah. So Meet there it. is a. If you go to MySQL documentation. There is one website that uh, that one link that says that these are the system variables that replication happens. Rest of the uh, things that don't happen. Another thing that since you ask about replication is uh, the keys used by tables for encryption for data at rest, be it redo log undo log or the user table, on one node, I mean on two different node will be different. So. The keys are never shared. The keys are never sent across the network. The keys are local to a node. So you set up one instance with one set of keys. Another instance uses a temp completely different set of keys for itself. Um, what is it, PKA or uh, descriptor It's AES. Yes, yeah, synchronous application. Because, well, asynchronous would be, uh, uh, sorry, asymmetric would be very uh, expensive. So for actual disk encryption, we are using AES-128. We had another question at the back, but like, mm -hmm. he, he's not thinking it. Did you, did you have a question? You raised your hand. Yeah, yeah, but like uh, that uh, graph uh, for the roles, which we showed, uh, 
can be showed? Like how it is displayed? The output of that function is, uh, so there is something called graph ML library. It outputs in it its own format. And then there are rendering tools. You just feed the, the file to it, and then they will construct the graph. Out. It's like a JSON format. Yeah. Thank All right. You so Thank you very much. Thank you.